Hello, I'm Keegan and I'm a research software engineer at the Caparezo lab. I'm going to be walking you through the steps for importing the demultiplex sequence data for the upstream portion of the tutorial. There are a few things to note before we get started. The first is, is that this data <coughs> is a subset of the main data set. This is because some of the upstream steps are quite computationally expensive and by using a smaller subset of the data we are able to show you how to actually perform these steps while allowing them to be completed in a reasonable period of time. The second is is that when you go to import your own data for your own project there are a variety of data formats that can be used to store data from the sequencing center. Each of these will require a different approach for importing into Chime 2. You can find a better tutorial or a more extensive tutorial on this on the docs.chime2.org website. Let's before we get started, let's discuss a little bit about what we mean by importing data into Chime 2. To be useful and accessible to Chime 2, your data needs to be stored inside of a Chime 2 artifact or .qza file. As previously discussed, this is simply a zip file that encloses your data as well as additional metadata and provenance tracking information. It can be unzipped with any regular zip program. It also stores information such as semantic type, <clears throat> which allows us to use the correct data for various operations. Let's begin by selecting the Import Demultiplex Sequence Data section of the tutorial. Once we are inside of this page, we're going to come up to the Interface Selector and make sure that the Galaxy Interface is selected. The first step in importing our data is to make a collection for Galaxy. This step is not a step that is strictly required for Chime 2. Rather, it makes the data available to Galaxy and then we can import it into Chime 2. You can see the steps listed here. Just wanted to point out here that a collection is what Galaxy is calling a folder. It's uh, nothing really other than that. It's a place for Galaxy to store files. Sounds impressive, but it's a folder. This table right here has both our files and also the source location. I'm going to go ahead and use this copy button to copy it to the system clipboard to ensure that there are no copy and paste errors. We're going to then switch over to the Galaxy interface. Inside the Galaxy interface we're going to select upload data. Once we have this dialog box up, we want to select tab 4, the rule-based uh, upload. We want to upload our data as a collection. The pasted table is what we want to use. Then we can actually paste our table in this box here. Select the box, right-click, paste. We don't want to touch anything else in the box. It should be good to go. We can click build here. We have these three issues that have um, occurred, which are expected. So the first one is we need to name the collection. Then we will specify a source column, that is where our files are found. And then we need to specify a column as a list identifier, or what those files are. Let's go back to the uh, tutorial page and we'll take a look at what it says to do here. <clears throat> the first thing that we're going to correct is we're going to add a rule by pressing the add or the plus rules button and choosing add modify column definitions. Then we'll add a definition and we'll select the list identifiers and set that to column A. Then we'll add a definition for the URL, 
and set that to column B or our source. We can apply that. Then we also need to, fi or finally, then we need to go ahead and actually name our collection. I'm going to copy this so that it will look the same um, throughout the rest of the tutorial. Out here, uh, the galaxy history may look a little different depending on what steps you've already performed. If you've had to rerun anything, the numbering will change, and because you can change the name of any um, of your objects in Galaxy, your names may not exactly match mine. That's okay. The important thing is that you have the data uh, correctly uploaded. So let's start by adding uh, those column identifiers. So click Rules, Add Modify the Column Definition. Let's go ahead and add a column definition. I'm going to pick list identifiers and I want to go ahead and select column A for that so I'll open the drop down and click on A great let's add our sources I'll click add definition in this case it's a URL so we're going to select the URL and then we want to make sure that we have column B selected we can click apply Right here, the rules show us that column A is set as the list identifiers, and column B is a URL. Finally, we need to name our collection. We can come down here to the name box in the bottom right-hand corner of the dialog, and I'm just going to paste it because I previously copied it. And we've called it data to import sequences. All right, our issues have been resolved up here at the top and that orange box has gone away. We're now ready to upload our data. I'll click Upload. Galaxy gives us this pop-up box. It just tells us that it is um, waiting on creating the collection. We can click Close now. And here we can see by the orange color and by the spinning dial that it is working on uploading our collection. Okay. Our Galaxy collection is created and the data is available to us in Galaxy. We can now import the data into Chime 2. For this section, we will look in the left hand side of the Galaxy interface. We'll find this correct tool, which in this case is Chime 2 Tools Import. We'll select the type of data. Again, this will vary depending on your data. We'll select the correct Chime 2 file format to import. This tells Chime 2 particular things about the data and the ways in which it can be used. Then we're going to do select, or for the import sequence, we're going to have a selection me mechanism. We're going to select the collection we created in the last step. We're going to set the elements. To the members of the collection. This number sign right here is any integer number. This will correspond with whatever um, number the Galaxy has assigned to your collection. So in my case it's going to be one, but it may be different in yours and that's okay. It just is um, Galaxy's way of tracking when things were created. We're not going to have an extension, so once we get all that set, we can go ahead and click the Execute button. Afterwards, we'll be sure to rename it to Demultiplex Sequences. So let's go back over to our Galaxy interface and see if it is uh, ready for us to complete this step. All right, it looks like our collection is cr successfully created. Here, we're going to select our, uh, the correct import tool. Most of the tools are arranged alphabetically. However, Chime 2 Tools contains important and frequently used tools, and so it is located at the top. We're going to select it. Once we've opened that, we're going to go ahead and click on Chime 2 Tools Import. This, this tool is designed to let us bring our raw data in and store it inside of a QZA or Chime 2 artifact as we previously discussed. We're going to select our type to import. 
and in this case we're looking for sample data paired in sequences with quality. Okay, selected that. This is a cassava 1.8 and it is a single lane per sample directory format. And then here we've selected one data to import sequences. You see that, that this is that where that number sign was in the tutorial page. Finally, we're going to leave the append extension as is. I'm going to click on execute. And when this is, when this is done, we will go ahead and rename it. All right. Our data has finished importing. Before we move on, we want to be sure to rename it. We're going to call this demultiplexsequences.qza. After we've put our name in here, we want to make, be sure to click on Save. All right, now that we have generated our demultiplex sequences, we can actually um, just visualize them real quick to, to kind of get an idea of what's going on. This uh, visualization will show us how many sequences were obtained for each sample, and more importantly, there is also a, an interactive uh, plot that shows the sequence quality uh, at each position. The tool that we're going to use here is part of the DMUX plugin and is called Summarize. So all we're going to do is provide multiplex sequences to it, execute it. When it's done, then we're going to go ahead and rename it as a summary visualization. So let's go ahead and switch over here. So we're going to find Chime 2 DMUX. Clicked on that to open up all the tools. We'll come down to the bottom to DMUX Summarize. We can click on it. We can see that Galaxy has already pre-populated my demultiplexsequences.qza into the uh, dataset selection. We don't need to set any other parameters, so let's click Execute. We actually can go ahead and uh, rename this while we're waiting. Alright, so we demultiplex sequences, QCV, and then we're going to make sure to save. Now that we have our demultiplex sequences summary visualization finished and we've renamed it, we can come over here onto the, on the right hand side of the interface and click on the label to open up and see more information about our visualization. There's a lot going on here, but the thing that we're really interested in is this view at Chime2 View. Chime2 View is a web app that is designed for being able to view Chime visualizations and artifacts in your browser. We can open up our visualization simply by clicking on the link. The first thing that we'll find in our visualization is this Overview tab. In this case, we'll find three things within this tab. The first is a table showing demultiplex sequence count summary information, a pair of frequency histograms, and a table displaying the sequence counts per sample. In this case, they've been sorted from greatest to least number of sequences in the sample. Let's begin with the sequence count summary table. First off, Let's note that there are an equal number of forward reads and reverse reads. This makes sense since we are using paired end sequence data. We'll find the minimum number of reads, that is 20,545 in a sample. We'll also find the median and mean. And fi finally, in regards to the per sample counts, we'll find that the maximum number of sequences found in a sample is 70,237. At the very bottom of this table, we find the sum total 
of all sequences in all of our sample data. Next, we'll take a look at the histograms. The histograms contain information about the number of samples that contain a particular range of sequence number. The data here seems to match up quite well with what we saw in the table above, with our minimum being slightly above 20,000 and our maximum being slightly above 70,000, while the majority of samples have for around 40,000 reads. These frequency histograms can be downloaded by clicking the link. Finally, we'll take a look at the per sample sequence counts table. Because they're sorted from greatest to least number of sequences per sample, we can easily find our maximum sequences per sample value that we saw in the table above. In this case, it's found in sample FMT.0106R. We can scroll down through and see the number of sequences in each sample. At the bottom, we can see the sample that contains the least number of sequences, that is 20,545. This is the same number found in the summary table at the top of the page. This number of sequences is found in sample FMT.0093S. We can also download this table by clicking the link that says Download as TSV. Let's move on over to the interactive quality plot. The interactive quality plot contains information that we will find useful for selecting the proper trimming or truncation parameter for the denoising step, which will be covered in the next part portion of the tutorial. Right now, let's just get a quick overview of what is contained in the interactive quality plot. The first thing to note about our interactive quality plot is that it is not generated from the entirety of all of the sequences in our sample. Rather, it is based on a random subsampling of 10,000 of the total sequences. This may lead to slight variations between my plot and what you're seeing on your own screen. However, the general shape should still be the same. The plot itself contains the axes of the quality score as stored in the FASTQ files from the sequencing center on the vertical axis and the sequence base position on the horizontal axis. If there's any area of the plot that we would like to get a closer look at, we can simply place our cursor on one edge and above, click and hold the left mouse button, drag a rectangle to encompass the area which we would like to examine more closely, and release to zoom in. If we are done looking at this particular position, we can simply double click anywhere on the plot to zoom back out. Let's take a closer look at the area of the plot where the sequence quality begins to drop off. For each base pair position, Chime 2 generates a box and whisker plot using the quality scores found within the 10,000 subsampled sequences. If we would like to more closely examine the values found at each position, we can simply hover our mouse cursor over the plot at that position and then come take a look at the parametric seven number summary found below the plot. This table contains the base position at the top of the plot as well as the quality score found at each percentile value. In the next tutorial section on denoising we'll take a closer look at what these values mean. It should also be noted that the quality scores will be different between the forward reads and the reverse reads, and so you may end up needing to choose a different trimming or truncation parameter value for each direction. We are also able to download the parametric seven number summary for a position and direction as a TSV. 
Finally, at the bottom of the page, we can find a parametric seven number summary of the sequence lengths from our subsample data. We have now finished looking at all of the plots and tables that have been generated for this visualization. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what else it contains. Moving to the top of the page, we can come up to the Details tab and click on it. The Details tab contains information about the particular visualization or artifact object. The name that we can find at the top is a name generated by Galaxy when creating this. The UUID is a unique identifier assigned by CHIME2 when an action is performed and an artifact or visualization is generated. We can also find type of object that we're looking at, in this case a visualization. We can also find a format which is applicable when looking at artifacts rather than visualizations. On this page can also be found the citation information that is automatically tracked by CHIME2. This contains the citation for both CHIME2 and any plugins that have been utilized by the user that contain citation information within them. Next, let's head on over to the Provenance tab. The Provenance section contains information about the history of how your visualization or Chime 2 artifact has been generated. It records both the data sets used and the actions performed to bring you to the current visualization or artifact. Our current visualization or artifact can be found at the bottom of the Provenance graph and is represented by two clickable objects. The first is the inner circular object, which represents the actual data object. The second object contains information about the action performed to generate the enclosed data object. We can find information such as runtime, the actual action performed, the input data set, any parameters, whether whether those supplied as defaults or by the user, any transformers employed by Chime2 to convert data from one format to another, the computing environment, the Chime2 version, and the plugin from which the action was taken. A quick note about the Chime2 version. You'll notice in this workshop that we're using a development version of Chime2. This is because we have included some additional features that have allowed us to use Q2 Galaxy and other actions for the workshop. These features will be included in the next release of Chime 2, that is the Chime 2 2022.2 release. At the top of the provenance graph, we can find information about our import step. Let's begin by taking a look at the data object. This data object, it is important to note, is actually the Chime2 artifact that was generated by our import step and not the raw data itself. We can see that its UUID matches the input of our visualization summary step. The semantic type is sample data of paired in sequences with quality. This is the semantic type that we supplied as a parameter to the import step. And finally, we have the format in which the data is stored. More on that here in a moment. Let's go ahead and take a look at our import action. Here we find information about runtime, action type, transformers used, computing environment, and Chime 2 and plugin version information. Of note here, we'll notice that Chime 2 used a transformer to convert the data from the original input Cassava 1.8 format to a sort of normalized storage format that is used for all single lane per sample paired in FASTQ data. I hope this has given you a good look at how we go about importing data into Chime 2 using the Q2 Galaxy interface, and I'll see you again soon in the denoising section of the tutorial.